Hi everybody, this is Gatsar. A quick appeal before uh, we begin today's conversation. I spend a inordinate amount of time providing you with free content. Many companies have contacted me trying to get me to monetize my content behind paywalls and so on. I've steadfastly refused to do so on the premise that I'd like to reach a wide audience. Ideas are important to be consumed. These conversations are important. The content is important. And so, you know, I've spent who knows how many hours over the years and how many heartaches receiving all sorts of hate, all sorts of risks taken because I do what I do. And yet very few people uh, support my efforts in very direct ways, meaning in a remunerative way. Uh, if you're in a position to do so, I would ask you to go to my YouTube channel uh, at the, ho the home page on in the top right hand corner there's a subscribe star button or a patreon button or a paypal button which you can use to show your support for the show so that i can keep this available freely for everyone uh, alternatively just a few days ago i set up a system that youtube provides for its content creators just below the videos you know where, it, where you see the thumbs up and thumbs down there is now an icon it's written thanks with a heart and a dollar sign if you click that one then you can donate per show you know you really love the show you want to donate x number of dollars then you can go ahead and do so please consider supporting my work i wish to continue to provide all of this uh, you know freely not behind a, uh, a paywall and believe me there are a lot of subscription based models out there now Many of those companies are contacting me and I don't want to be a martyr. I, I don't want to be the idiot martyr who just keeps doing what I do at great personal cost and effort, but never being remunerated for it in an extrinsic way. I think that's only fair as an exchange. I've spent many years doing this and maybe now all of the fans that I have could, I mean, look, it's an insurance policy, right? You're, you're protecting those that are putting their necks on the line to do this. And if you are listening to this on one of the podcasts, I haven't set up yet a, a financial support system via the audio podcast, but you can certainly go to my YouTube channel, as I mentioned earlier, and donate in the same way that anyone else who's watching it via YouTube would have done so. So I hope that you will consider doing so irrespective of whether you consume uh, my show uh, on YouTube or via the podcast platforms. Thanks again, and here is today's guest. Hi guys, today I've got another fantastic guest with me. I've been on her show about maybe five or six months ago. You were kind enough, Candace, to invite me to discuss my latest book. So your uh, stage name is Eva Lovia. Your uh, real name is Candace Horvath. Thanks so much for being on. How you doing? Good. Thank you for having me on. Oh, I'm so I'm so happy to have you on. Uh, you are officially the second guest to have uh, been in this industry. Uh, the first one is I don't know if you knew her personally, but she's gotten into some trouble recently. I don't know what the resolution of that case is. Her her name, or at least her stage name, is Mercedes Carrera. Do you, Do you know who that is? Yeah, yeah. I've never like worked with her, but we've been on the same sets together. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Did you know anything about her case? Do you know what happened to it? Wasn't there something with like kidnapping or something crazy like that? There, there was. It involved a child, so I don't know if it, if that's kind of a custody thing. I, I never followed up, but uh, it seemed like it was some nasty stuff, so I thought maybe you had some inside information on that. No, I always like try to stay out of all of that drama, but I think... I can't remember because it was a, it was what like a year back or maybe a couple Something years like that, back. Yeah. I think it was a little bit darker than just kidnapping. I don't know if it was her kid. I mean, I hope it wasn't her kid, but um, yikes! Well, you yeah, hope not it's, good stuff. You hope it's not any kid, but uh, in any case, uh, okay. So let's talk about your journey. So you were a it, is it right to now say former? You're you're officially retired. I mean, yes, but I feel like it's one of those like forever things, right? Like it's. It, I just kind of have to accept that. So I could completely disappear off of like all social media and they would still say like the porn star. The, so the, it right. depends on your school of thought, I guess. No, but you're not still 
engaged i mean you're not in the industry are you still acting in the industry or you no i'm not in the industry i've been out of the industry for i think going on like five years almost four years so maybe you could tell us how you got into it what was the first uh you know contact point with the industry maybe sure. you know just give us the, the story because i'm sure it's an interesting one so um i guess i was kind of exposed to that industry at, a, at an early age my mom did like nude modeling so it was kind of just acceptable, like that overtly sexual attitude. So it was something I've always been curious about, but I was actually super shy growing up. I was with the same guy for like six years. Um, I never felt like it was the right time to kind of explore that side of me. So when that relationship ended and I just moved away from university, um, I started getting offers from modeling because I was working at Hooters and I did like their calendar and all that. So people just start coming to you and they're like, shoot for this magazine and that. Um, I started with like these hot rod magazines, like motorbikes and all of that. And then quickly you get more um, lucrative offers that also require less clothing. So <laughs> that kind of just uh, continued until I was like, okay, I'm ready. I want to, I want to do big movies. Um, and I reached out to a couple of companies that I really liked that were just like girl, girl, like nothing too intense. And I was like, do you try out? How does this work? Like, what do I send you? And they're like, we just need a picture. And, um, if you can email it over and they were like, we'll fly you to Miami. I was there for a weekend. Um, the sets that I had shot like quickly rose to like the number one viewed and rated, uh, set of all time. So wow. then I got contracted and I was in the industry for, Ooh, I would say like probably like eight years, eight to 10 years, um, just like shooting and trying to, um, I guess, navigate it as carefully as possible. And what, I mean, you, you know, for someone who hasn't been in the industry, you know, for most people, of course, sex is a very private exercise or mm -hmm. enterprise. Of course, in your case, it becomes something that's very public. So mm -hmm. it doesn't matter how much one is comfortable with their sexuality, how much they've grown up in an environment where that's, uh, you know, that's okay, as you said, with your mom, uh, there still has to be some sense of trepidation. I mean, I'm going to take off my clothes in front of a whole bunch of people. There's kind of a mechanistic mm -hmm. aspect to it. It's not with the dim lights. It's not with the very white <laughs> music. So how do you navigate those, I mean, I guess eventually, seven years into your career, maybe you don't care anymore, but those first few times, how do you get over that that hump? It, my first scene, I was shaking like a leaf. I was so nervous. I was like, what am I getting myself into? Thankfully, it wasn't a huge set. There was only like two people on set that were doing like lighting and sound and whatever. So it wasn't um, one of the larger sets that I've been on. But I don't know, it's almost like, and it's going to sound crazy to some people, but for me, I just can get into a flow state really easy in that environment. So like all I see and like all I'm engaging with is that person that I'm working with. So there could be, I've been on sets that have, you know, over 50 people there and it doesn't register to me. Like I just kind of get into this tunnel vision. Wow. Um, I know it's like a superpower, but for me, it I get more nervous sometimes like walking around in a bikini by a pool than when I go to a set. Like to me, that makes me more insecure. Why? I, Why? Because in the other case, you feel there's going to be less judgment because people are just watching for the sex. Whereas if you're in a bikini, I'm going to judge you whether you have cellulite. Is it, is it a judgment based? I think it's a judgment thing. And I okay. think for some reason, like when I'm on set, like no one's really there to like make you feel like shit or to judge you. Like we're all in it together kind of mentality. And then when you're at the pool, like that's just what we do, right? So we're like constantly sizing up everyone that we see, whether we're aware of it or we're not. So for me, I'm a lot more comfortable when I show up in that atmosphere than when I'm in public. So you began, so those, those first original scenes were same sex scenes. Yes. When did you transition to boy girl scenes? And then how, how was that transition? How stressful was it? Blah, blah, blah. Oh man. Okay. So I started shooting, um, like boy girl scenes when, Ooh, it was like, it had to have been like probably three years in or so it was a while in. Oh, okay. Um, and it was like a very thought out decision. I was, um, engaged at the time and with my now husband and it was like months and months and months of conversations we're like how is this going to affect 
the relationship? What does this mean for the relationship? What do we want in terms of our romantic, um, our romantic boundaries? Um, what does it mean for my career? And I mean, it was stressful because obviously there was that risk of it breaking the relationship. Like neither of us knew how we were going to respond to it because we've never been exposed to that kind of situation. So we kind of both took that leap of faith and said, you know what, like we're going to see where this goes. And for, for me, I wanted to try to reach that level of like superstardom in the industry. And there's no way to do that with just doing same sex scenes. Like you kind of have to do something bigger. So in a sense, forgive me for interrupting. So in a sense, there's an implicit calculus that took place there, which said my desire, and I'm not asking this judgmentally. I'm getting, I'm trying to get down to the bare bones psychology. Mm -hmm. My desire to reach that superstardom status, you know, is supersedes the very possible risk that it's going to break up my relationship with this man. And I'm willing to take that risk. I mean, that's effectively what you, what you did. Kind of, but I think it's also having like the faith in the relationship that we were going to like withstand it. Right. Like we, we had been together for years at that point. Um, no relationship is easy. So we've already gone through like several trials and tribulations just as any young couple kind of does as you're trying to like find out who you both are. Um, and I think we both just had that confidence that both of us would be able to grow together and navigate those issues. Not that it was going to be just like super easy and all lollipops and unicorns, but that like we could troubleshoot together. And at the end of the day, like our values aligned on such a deep level that we could get through whatever mishaps were going to come our way. Okay. So let's continue. I mean, I was going to discuss some of this stuff later, but it's, we're in it. So let's, let's continue sure. with this. So was were there ever any on his part now because you're the one i mean is he is he also in the industry no okay so so it it's the burden is on him to have to deal with your reality and we know that certainly the uh the the possibility of imagining your partner never mind actually seeing your partner imagining your partner engaging in a, in a sexual act with someone else is not something that most men would line up to do and mm -hmm. so were there any problems at the at the onset of of that journey oh for sure <clears throat> he was uh there were times where he had to figure out his like his jealousy, right? Because it's very natural, obviously, given that situation, um, like you're wired to not want anyone else with your, with your lady. Um, but he, you know, he had his own process of kind of finding what his values were for the relationship and what was important to him. And kind of what we've both aligned on is, you know, freedom is, the, is really important for both of us and independence is really important for both of us. And he, he actually saw it as more risky to voice a strong opinion and like, force me to not go into that, right. To like, um, I guess like limit my possibilities as far as my career went, because he's like, well, then that can lead to resentment. And what if we don't work out anyways? And then I'm having this effect on who she could have been. Um, and I want her to make her decisions. And if we both end up together, then that's amazing. And that's what we won't both want. Um, but yeah, he had like, I think it was a real like mind fuck for him when we would go to like a convention and he would be meeting these guys that I've worked with. And he's like, well, this is weird because he's here with his wife. So it's like challenging all of these beliefs, right? He thinks that we, because I had sex with this person, we must have something more. There must be some kind of connection. Someone wants something more than just like that transactional, um, you know, seen that happened. And then he's like, Oh wait, no, they're married. They have kids. They're happy. And I'm here with her. And like, there's nothing more that's going on. Um, so I think it was just, yeah, just challenging, like what you believed were the only paradigms for a, a healthy relationship. Would he, has he ever see, I mean, has he ever watched any of I mean, Cause one way would be, I'm just going to completely block it out. I know it happened and mm -hmm. it's driving me crazy. But I certainly don't want to see it. Has has he actually seen it? Oh, for sure. Yeah. And I mean, I don't think that that pretending it doesn't exist is a good idea. I think you have to have open communication. And it's like, I had a really hard day knowing that you were in LA shooting today. Like, And me being like open enough and offering like that, that space for him to be honest, right? Not like we made this decision together and how dare you come at me and like, you know, challenge the decision we, we both made for this, right? Like, no, it's like, 
this is a relationship and I'm going to respect you and I'm going to respect your feelings and I want us to do well. So in order for us um, to both like have a successful marriage, I have to like, I have to be here for you when you need me to be here. And if he were to ever, ever said like, okay, like enough is enough and I don't want you to do this um, anymore. Like we would have talked about it. I, I can't guarantee that I would have quit, but I wouldn't have written him off for it. But there were definitely days where he was like, oh, I don't know if I can, if I'm going to be able to do this. And we would just talk it out, talk it out. I mean, it was, it was a daily practice, you know what I mean? Just like lots of communication. I hope you don't mind that I stick on this because again, as an evolutionary psychologist, that reality is pretty much violating every possible, you know, uh, uh, dynamic, right? Where mm -hmm. sexual territoriality and romantic jealousy. And so, so it's fascinating from that perspective. So, okay. So w is there anything, so you, I don't know if, do you know what theory of mind is? Are you familiar with that term? No. Theory, theory of mind is a is, is part of human sociality, which is that as we go through cognitive de developmental stages, uh, one of the ways that we're able to communicate is I can put myself in your mind so that I can predict, you know, to empathize with you and so on. So, for example, autistic children, one of the ways that we're able to uh, diagnose them as being autistic is we give them certain tests where they fail a theory of mind. Uh, can mm -hmm. I put myself in the mind of this other kid to know what they could have known in this situation? And autistic children completely fail at it. So, mm. so now what I'm going to do is ask you sort of to put yourself, is there anything that he could do that could have triggered the same challenges that you put him through in having to imagine, if not see you with all of these other beautiful men having sex like, can you think of a situation well for sure so when we made the decision for me to make that step in my career I let him have the same rules that I had so um I saw a huge discrepancy in relationships within the industry so you would see a lot of girls that were um dating they call them civilians so anyone that's like not in the industry and the rule it was like rules for thee and not for me so you had to be um, at home waiting for your girl to get back after she did whatever she did at work that day. And if he even like, you know, liked a picture on Instagram, then that was a problem. And I was like, that doesn't make sense. So for me, I thought congruency was really important. So if I'm going to be able to be with other men, whether it was for work or not, then those rules also applied to him. So we kind of had like, I would say an open relationship, but there was still a lot of boundaries. Like we set like very specific rules. And the first time that he was with somebody um, and he told me, I was like red and just filled with jealousy and rage. And I was like, I had to take a moment and be like, what a hypocrite you're being. Yeah. You can Google and there are all of these things and it's public. And then he was with one person in private and you're having this really really overt reaction. Um, so I had to like, just spend a lot of like uh, time with myself and just like meditating and be like, well, what does that mean? And why did I react that way? And, um, are these fears founded on any actual evidence? And they're not right. Like my, my reasons for jealousy go to like, like scarcity mindset. So he's going to leave me. There's not enough love to go around or that it necessarily means anything more than a physical interaction like that. It has to be love. All of these things that I've, I've believed to be true. Um, and it's kind of like a muscle. It's not like it ever goes away. You constantly have to work at it. I mean, it's been years since either of us have been with another person. Um, and if it were to probably happen, you know, let, he's out of town right now. Like, let's say he hooks up with somebody and he's like, Hey, by the way, I did this. I would probably be like, what the heck? Right. Like I'm here at home with the baby. What the heck? Um, would it ruin our marriage? Absolutely not. Because to me, I think if something like infidelity breaks the relationship, I would question like the fortitude of that relationship. Um, but it's that like love goes past those instinctual feelings, right? Like that's what it is. So it's not denying that those exist, but it's saying, Hey, I also have like this incredible software and I can decide what I want to do with right. it. You know, what, as you were explaining your reaction of jealousy to his, uh, was it was it one time or did he did he he's it's probably been like two or three times in like the 11 years we've been together and it was a long 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 time ago. so there's still a massive asymmetry in terms of for the sure yeah okay so but mm -hmm. as you were describing your first uh feelings of of anger and jealousy mm -hmm. uh 
the words that you used are exactly the ones that I would have predicted. And so I'm going to step back now and get into some of the science. You said, you know, oh, is there not enough love to go around and so on. So there is a great set of studies that were conducted by uh, a good friend of mine uh, named David Buss, who's a pioneer in evolutionary psychology. He actually wrote the foreword to one of my books, The Consuming Instinct. Uh, and in, in the in the paper in question, so if, if you ask men and women to just give you sort of a general feeling of their felt romantic uh, jealousy, then you get no sex differences. But if you then break it up in an evolutionarily relevant way, whereby you break up the source of jealousy to either sexual infidelity or romantic infidelity, then you get huge sex differences. So that mm -hmm. if, if so, if I ask now, I bring in men and women into the lab, and I you know put a bunch of measures on them to actually measure their physiological and psychological distress at the following. So please imagine uh, your husband or wife, and then you describe a a passionate situation of sexual infidelity, or the romantic infidelity would be your your husband or wife is uh, has is developing this emotional bond with their coworker. She she understands his jokes. They they share you know they're in sync and so on. So it's emotional uh, bonding, but there's no sexual thing. Well, it turns out, as you may or may not be surprised, I mean both both vignettes are not attractive to both men and women, but sexual infidelity is extraordinarily more triggering to men and. Emotional infidelity is more triggering than sexual infidelity to women. And mm -hmm. of course, the evolutionary answers, you you already alluded to them. So in the, in the case of sexual infidelity, I, I don't give a shit if, you, if you're if you emotionally tied to the guy or not. I, I don't want the guy to touch you, right? Because, mm -hmm. because and, and of course, that goes back to paternity uncertainty, right? We mm -hmm. are a biparental species. Uh, I don't want to be investing in a woman and certainly the offspring if I'm not sure whether it's mine or the sexy Italian gardener. And therefore, mm -hmm. uh, men have evolved the cognitive, emotional, behavioral systems to try to thwart you know, that uh, type of threat. On the other hand, for women, uh, if a man has sex with a, another woman, but he truly has no emotional investment, that could be less threatening than establishing an emotional bond, which could lead to you packing your bags and leaving. So mm -hmm. even in the context of what happened, where he went with another woman, the mm -hmm. fact that he could assuage your sense of insecurity by saying it was a one-time thing, in mm -hmm. a sense, that resolves your, your, your sense of insecurity. Whereas mm -hmm. in his case, the fact that he can go to, I'm not, he didn't pay me money to try to defend him here. So I'm not trying <laughs> to, but, but, but you see, there's an asymmetry because. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Well, so what do you think? Do you, do you, do you, do you, do you agree with that evolutionary analysis? Yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense. I So I've heard another argument too, or like, um, I guess theory of like early homo sapiens. And I'm curious the validity behind it. So I heard one because obviously there were different tribes and we can expect that there were differences amongst them. Like not everyone was a carbon copy and how like their social dynamic played out. So one theory that I heard was that in certain tribes is that like all of the, I guess like higher up um, men, like of like the hierarchy when the woman was fertile, like she would have sex in that window with all of them. And that was so that when she did have the baby, that there wasn't one man responsible. It was like all of the men responsible. And they did that to kind of ensure the thriving of that child. So I'm curious, A, if like you believe that that was a possibility. And if so, wouldn't that challenge, I guess, the, the monogamy standpoint or like the physicality standpoint from a man's perspective? Yeah, great question. So now we're getting into the hardcore science, which I'm, I'm happy to do. So a couple of ways to answer that. Number one, so there is a lot of research that shows, so, so we, we know the evolutionary reasons why men may seek sexual variety, mm -hmm. but what, what oftentimes, uh, at least detractors of evolutionary psychology who don't really understand what evolutionary psychology is about, think that what evolutionary psychologists argue is that men wish to philander left, right, and center, whereas women are these Victorian uh, you know, prudes which of mm -hmm. course they're not. And so there's there's several lines of evidence that suggest that they're not. So, and let me give you uh, these lines. So one, if you look at the size of testes, testicles, 
of a of a, of the males of a species in proportion to their body size. So take for example mountain gorillas. Uh, they live in what's called polygynous mating arrangements. So meaning what one dominant male controls sexual access to many females. So his testicles are actually very small in proportion to his uh, incredible physical stature because there isn't a constant threat of sperm wars. So that in the case of the mountain gorilla, uh, th that mating arrangement has selection pressures on a morphological feature of, of men, in the, males, mm -hmm. in this case, their testes. Take, for example, chimps. Chimps are much more akin to the tribe that you you, you so-called referred to because chimps are walking testicles. Basically, their entire bodies are there to support these massive testicles because they're having sex nonstop all over the place. And so, so that's that. Now, the question then becomes, so where do human males fall on that scale? Well, we fall not to the extent of chimps, but closer to chimps than to uh, mountain gorillas. So the mm -hmm. male te human male testicles suggest certainly that f human females would have been quite likely to mate with more than one male. So that's mm -hmm. one, one line of evidence coming from comparative psychology, comparing across uh, species or comparative uh, morphology. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a second line of evidence would be some, uh, there's a guy, uh, he's now retired, his name is uh, Robin Baker, who wrote a famous book in the 1990s called Sperm Wars, where mm -hmm. he basically argued that there are three phenotypes of spermatozoa. There's the, the classic sperm, you know, the sort of the fertilizing sperm, but there are two other types of firm, f sperms that are, quote, misformed, that actually are not fertilizers. One, they are... They are blockers. They're simply there to block the possibility that another man's sperms might enter the female reproductive tract. And then there are killer sperms that don't look for any eggs. They're simply there to, to kill other men's sperms. Now, if that is an evolutionary mechanism, and since sperm could only be viable in a woman's reproductive tract for about 72 hours, that suggests that it was quite conceivable for women, ancestrally speaking, to have mated with more than one man within a 72-hour period. Mm -hmm. So that certainly suggests that what you said earlier is true. But now here's the, the, the little rub with what you said. Uh, if you look at all types of mating arrangements in, in human societies, about 85% have what's called an allowance for polygyny. Uh, one man, multiple women. Mm -hmm. Uh, monogamy is about 15%, and a very, very, very small percentage, way less than 1%, allows for polyandry. Polyandry is one woman shared by multiple men, and usually when you have polyandry, it's fraternal polyandry, meaning the multiple men who are sharing the woman are not the high-status guys that you're talking about. They are brothers. Because what that does then is that even though I can't be assured that the child is mine, I'm at least assured that it is genetically linked to me so that my mm -hmm. inclusive fitness still goes up, even though my direct reproductive fitness might not be guaranteed. Does that, it was a very, that was a whole lecture of evolutionary psychology, but does that, does that answer your question? Yeah, that's super interesting. So you're saying only 15% of humans are monogamous uh, well 15 percent of cultures have had institutionalized culture. monogamy now okay. in those now even in societies where polygyny is lot by the way when people say polygamy they're using the term wrong polygamy just means one with many but polygamy comes in two forms it comes mm -hmm. in polygyny which is the typical case you know mormons muslims one man multiple women harems and polyandry is one woman, multiple men. The main case of polyandry is Tibetan polyandry. And there are clear evolutionary reasons why they had that system. So, but even in most cultures where polygyny is allowed, many people end up in monogamous unions because the, the for there to be polygyny, you have to have a very high status male that is able to monopolize sexual access to multiple women. For example, in Islam, you can have up to four wives, 
wives, but many don't because it's stated that you have to be able to invest in them completely equally. And most men aren't able to pull that off, whether it be in terms of resources, whether it be in terms of sexual prowess. So for all sorts of reasons, you're not going to be able to allocate your investment in whichever form it takes to the four women. So you end up in monogamous unions. Oh, wow. That's super interesting. But by the way, I, I, so sticking with polyandry versus polygyny, I, this is very much in, in the porn business. Probably one of the uh, studies that I have most fun explaining to to my students uh, is the, the the following one. So if you if if you look at most societies, it's po- po- polygynous, one man, multiple women. So you think of the fantasy of the guy being with you know five gorgeous girls and they're having sex. Whereas if you do a content analysis, and you you would know this as a former member of that industry, it's a lot more polyandrous depictions. One woman with multiple men. As a matter of fact, that study has been done. So a guy sat there as a scientific project, did a content analysis of porn movies, and found that there are a lot more depictions of one woman, multiple guys, than one man multiple women Mm -hmm. and so then the question is well first of all from your experience do do you confirm that that's true oh 100 percent. exactly Mm -hmm. so now the the question then becomes why so if we think that men want to have a harem of girls i want to be fantasizing about having sex with five girls then why why and and of course the the porn makers understand psycho male psychology so why isn't the opposite? And the, the argument is it's because it triggers sperm war in the, in the mindset of men, right? So the I, so even if you look at animal husbandry, and forgive me, I know you're the guest and it seems like I'm speaking the most, so hopefully we'll go back to I'm you. I'm learning so much. This is amazing. Okay, thank you. Uh, so so basically what, if you look at animal husbandry, where you're mm-hmm. raising, you know, you're, you, you have a stud and you want to procreate, you know, his seed, you often time to get him in the mood, you'll have him look at someone else, like a, a, another bull having sex, even if it's with a mannequin, because that gets literally the rise out of him, right? And so the idea is that as long as we're trying to just be visually titillated for a short-term mating, right? I, I don't want to imagine my my wife with four guys, but if I'm just trying to get uh, you know uh, sexual stimulation, then that does increase the rise out of me in seeing one woman with multiple men because it triggers that sperm competition. Does that make sense? Wow, that is fascinating. Because I've always been curious too. I'm like, why would you want to see that many men? It doesn't make sense to me for like a straight guy. Um, but yeah, there's some there you now, underlying here's, reason. Here's the inc- now here's the kicker. Here's the 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 the, the, the kicker of this whole story. So th- there was a study that was done, published in a really top prestigious journal, so this is not some sort of quack stuff, uh, where they they took men and they either assigned to them an image that's not polyandrous, w- one woman, multiple men, or that was polyandrous, ask the men to take those stimuli home and return with the fruits of their manual labor, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And then what they wanted to do is measure certain metrics of the sperm that they produced and what they showed in line with what you would expect from a sperm competition hypothesis is that the men who had masturbated to the uh, polyandrous image had sperm that was more motile Mm -hmm. moving more and that's exactly what you would expect from a evolutionary perspective if you believe in the sperm competition hypothesis the only thing that hasn't been explained is how does that mechanism actually work right so we know that the sperm becomes more motile and vigorous but we don't know what's the link between the brain and the actual sperm but so there you have it now you know why you have bukkake scenes and all the rest of it (laughs) so basically too if you're trying to like get pregnant maybe throw on something that's a little bit more extreme and you'll have faster stronger swimmers exactly right so okay going back to a more personal thing so as you're doing these scenes uh i understand you're an actress you're not always into it but how Mm -hmm. often i mean there's also just a mechanistic sensorial reality of you know if you eat a juicy burger it it tastes good and you feel good if you're having sex is it always the case that irrespective of whom you're with uh you know sex is pleasurable and so 
I'm getting something out of it or are, whether it be you or other women, we know that there is a, a mindset also involved where you could mm-hmm. completely, as you said, tunnel vision. Is your Does your tunnel vision include sensorial pleasure or tunnel vision means I'm just in the flow of the act, not unlike if I were just sprinting? W- which one is it? Most of it, so for me, I was always called a diva. I always had a guest list. So like to all the people that argue the gatekeeper thing, like I still was gatekeeping to a certain extent. So I only worked with like this smallest of men that I had approved. Um, so I was, I wanted to produce like the best scene possible. So there had to be something I could find that was attractive in that person, whether it was like, um, like who they were or like a physical attribute or whatever. Um, I would say it's kind of a wash. I would say it was, it's probably about 50, 50, whether or not it was like focus on the scene and just perform really well so that it looks good because there's almost like this sense of like over overacting. Like you kind of have to overdo things for it to translate to film. Like if you were to have sex, like you normally have sex with someone, no one is going to be watching that. Yeah. It's not that exciting. Um, so sometimes you're more focused on that. And then sometimes you're like, wow, this is both right. Like I'm having a pleasurable experience and I'm also performing at the same time and they're not conflicting. Um, but it depends on so much. It depends on like the type of scene you're doing, whether you're like, I did one, um, one project we were in the UK and we were shooting in like war bunkers. So it was freezing. Like I'm talking like probably 40 degrees or something like that. Cause it was also the season. Um, I mean, there's no way I was going to have a, real orgasm in that, in that situation, right? There's like water everywhere. It's damp, it's cold, it's dark. Like I just want a blanket and I want food. Um, so it it totally depends on, on the day, but But, there's both. And would, forgive me, this is a very personal technical question, but would the rate of the likelihood of achieving orgasm be the same? So let's say it's 50%. Is -hmm. it 50% in your film industry and 50% in your personal life. And and it could be you answering it or in general, all the women in the industry or no, when I'm acting, it's just much less likely to happen because I don't know this guy because there are 17 other people, or can it be the same hit success ratio if you'd like? It's a lot harder when you're filming because like most women, I'm sure like most of your listeners know, like they need both like clitoral stimulation and penetration to achieve an orgasm. Um, porn doesn't necessarily always allow for that. So if like the positioning is like, no, that looks stupid or we want you to do this. So it's not like no one's prioritizing your pleasure. So it's definitely not guaranteed. And then when in my personal life, if that's something that like, if it's a rule of mine, like I have to orgasm every time, which it's not like, I think you can have good sex without getting there as a woman. Um, but you can be like, hold on a second. Like I need to do this or I need to move here. I need to like maybe grab a toy, whatever it is. Like you're in control of that situation. Um, whereas if you're filming, you're not. So I would say like my success rate personally is a lot higher in my personal life than it is on camera. I mean, I I would think that what you just said would have to probably apply to every single female Mm-hmm. adult star if only by the nature of what they're doing right it has right to be. yeah mm-hmm. now what about so let's switch it to the men now in the old days you know the the barrier to entry for a man to be able to do this without the blue pill is that are you able to on command get the erection keep the erection switch mm-hmm. you know be mechanic because of course the woman can ultimately fake whatever but the guy he's got to Something has to happen. Uh, Mm -hmm. Did that change? Did it become easier? So this is kind of a historical question that kind of precedes when you got into it, right? But but did the capacity of men to enter the industry improve as a result of the blue pill magic? Oh, that's interesting. (sighs) Yeah, I would say that it probably allows for more people to enter than maybe wouldn't have physically been able to perform that. So I would imagine that the quality has to have gone up. The problem is, is like they've escalated from pills to like now there's injections and that's really, really bad for guys. So, um, injections to stay hard. Yeah. Like they, you actually shoot your dick up with something. And, um, not only, I mean, so there was a lot of reasons I got out of the, out of the industry. Um, one of them was that was becoming more prevalent. And to me, like have like, you jab something in you right now, you have an open wound <laughs> and you're about to be intimate. That's so not okay or sanitary. 
Um, so that was one major reason as I started seeing that over and over. But a consequence of that, and these guys get in pretty young, is it stops working. So then there's like some men that now have um, like valves put internally that they have to like pump up. So like they put like a pump in the guy's testicles and then there's like a shaft that goes in the penis and it actually like manually yeah. will pump it up because they can't do it anymore. Because of the original injections. Yeah. Oh my goodness. It's crazy. Oh my. Now, okay, so sticking with the guys, it across so so one of the things, of course, I study as an evolutionary psychologist is human mate choices. What are the attributes that women look for in a man? What are the attributes that men look for in women? And of course, there are certain universal preferences that whether you're the Hatsa tribe in Central Africa or a porn star or whomever, you're going to have the same sort of preferences. So you said earlier, uh, you know, I used to be called a diva. I had a very select group of men that I chose. So in a mm-hmm. sense, that is a form of mate preference in the context of your industry. What were the criteria that you that made you choose these five guys versus these f- 500 possible guys? What, what was it? So for me, it was I would take a look at like their career, like if they seemed professional, like that they had been in for a while. Like I wasn't going to work with anyone brand new because I wanted to make sure that they were being safe, right? Like there's like ethics that go behind it. Are you being safe in your personal life or are you not? Like, yeah, there's testing, but you know, there's still a window of error when, even when you're testing every two weeks, right? So I wanted to try to make that as manageable as possible. Um, are you, like physicality was important to me. So are you taking care of like your body? To me that I think that says a lot more than just like vanity, right? Like you're putting in effort, like there's some kind of, um, I guess quality assurance in that regard. So Ron Jeremy is not on your list. No, Ron Jeremy is not on my list. And he's not the nicest guy either. That's what I heard. Yeah, he got into a bit of trouble. And I mean, I can attest. I think the first time I met him was at a convention and he just walked up and like pinched my nipple. And I was like, I don't, we've never met. This is crazy. So he got, I feel like you see that a lot is if you're in the industry too long or if you don't have like a good life outside of it, then you get stuck in your character. And then I guess like what you think is okay isn't really applicable in the rest of society. So I think it's so important to have that grounding. And I think he might've been one of those people that just got stuck in his alter ego a little bit too hard. Wow. Now, so in your case, you said that you when you started, you know, when you were with your husband, you had that opening conversation mm-hmm. or to, to, to get into the thing. You had this possibility of having an open relationship. Do you feel that most people who currently are in the industry or after they retire, are they more likely to have, quote, unconventional uh, sexual contracts precisely because they've been in that industry so for example are you more likely to desire an open relationship because the reality is you've had more sexual adventures if only because of your profession and my instinct to seek variety is simply accentuated once i've been able to sleep with many beautiful women or to have sex with many handsome guys i'm just less likely to i'm going to get itchy within the confines of my monogamy is that something that you think you've experienced and or other people in the industry? So I would have guessed that that was going to be the answer or the norm, but everyone that I'm like, that I'm close with that's now out of the industry, it's almost like quite the opposite. So it's like I had this desire, this curiosity for some people, this need, and then I satisfied that with my career. And now that I'm kind of ready to start transitioning or slow down, um, that you accidentally find yourself in monogamy. And <laughs> to me, I'm like, isn't that kind of more beautiful though than than forced monogamy? It was. It's like no, there's this. The commonality is I think that we look at sex as less detrimental to the relationship. Like even if the the rules are that you are monogamous, like let's say somebody slips up, I think that there's more of a grace within that relationship to talk about it and then to to get over it together than the immediate, like I'm going to call my lawyer and you're going to see your kid, kids on weekends, right? right? So you have to ask which one is the healthier response, which one's better for the family. I know two parent households definitely guarantee the success of your kid more so than being one, one household or single parent household. Um, so it's kind of like 
you had these urges and you got to explore them in the healthiest, safest way possible. And now you can fully appreciate monogamy. And then some people also have like that window where it's like, so to use me as an example, I'm one of those accidental monogamy couples, right? Like we started this thing and we were open and then all of a sudden we're like, oh my gosh, it's been four years and we're now monogamous and we have a baby. Um, I would say like if there was ever like that, that urge where someone wanted to go explore a relationship with someone else physically, um, again, I'd probably be a little bit jealous and if it was something I wasn't okay with, we would talk about, but by no means am I going to blow up my life for it. So I think it's just leaving room for error, right? Like you get married and you're in your twenties and the goal is to die together. So like die when you're like 90 or a hundred, there's going to be error, whether it's infidelity or whether it's lying or whether it's like a financial scandal, like there's probably going to be some, some bumps along the road. So I think it's just allowing for that grace. Wow. That's a beautiful answer. Uh, so you, you, you mentioned earlier, you know, I, I, I kind of scratched that itch and explored those needs, which kind of leads me to a really interesting question relating to which, what are the reasons that women get into porn? So your answer is kind of a, a very na- natural one. You know, we, we all have a desire for variety and I decided to itch that, that, that or scratch that itch as mm-hmm. part of my profession. Now, an alternate uh, uh, narrative that is often proposed for why women get into into porn is what's called i mean literally in the scientific literature as the so forgive me for the term uh, it's called the damaged goods hypothesis which basically argues that the only rational quote rational way that a woman would ever get into the industry is if she was already damaged and therefore what else could explain that she would get into now i wrote an article i can't remember exactly when maybe eight eight years ago on my Psychology Today column where I was describing someone else's research where they had tested the damaged good hypothesis and had not found it to be true. Meaning mm-hmm. that it, it, they had falsified the idea that women get, many women get into porn for what you said, they're young and they wanna have fun. Some get in because I can do three scenes and make more money than I would for the next six months working at some useless job. And, and so it wasn't at all the idea that, you know, it was the woman who was sexually abused and wasn't, you know, is now taking crystal meth and that's why she is doing this mm-hmm. so what from your personal anecdotes what 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 have you seen about this issue it's all I think what I can see from like a bird's eye perspective is the top girls in the industry so if you look at like the top 200 girls top 100 girls um, there's the commonality of like their their work ethic right so it's not it's not that they're getting in just to have fun. They're also like treating it like a career. Very few of those girls that you're going to see in the top, like are the damaged goods situation. And yeah, there's probably a couple, right? Because of course that would make sense. What I tend to see for everybody else or from the stories that I've heard, because if you are a top performer, you don't tend to find yourself on set with or on, or working for companies that, people below kind of do. It's just, it's a totally different animal. Um, the damaged good things I would probably say is more prevalent, like just by a numbers basis. Um, but the girls that are excelling, I would say rarely fall into that category. Um, I wish there was a way to kind of filter for that. I wish that there was some kind of standard for accepting people into the industry because I do think it is, it is wrong to take advantage of that on that level. But unfortunately you get in as an adult and that's your responsibility is to protect yourself and not somebody else to protect you. Um, so, I mean, they both exist. I would, I would guess, and it's purely a guess that there are probably more damaged goods than people going into it for a healthy, like a purely healthy conscious reason. But it's interesting that you said, Oh, I wish there was a way to screen for this because it, you, you do screen for sexually transmitted diseases, mm-hmm. yet you don't screen for psychological damage. And wouldn't it yeah. be wonderful if, you know, when, when, when we try to hire you at a company, we make you go through all these personality tests because we want to see if there's a match between your personality and the organizational culture. Right. And so 
I wonder if that would be something that would be, I mean, I understand you're not in the industry anymore, but it, wow, that would be such a great thing if there was a truly diagnostic tool that we can use to gauge, you know, this person falls on the, she's starting to lean towards having had a past that was damaged goods. We don't want to. And then I wonder if you were to institute something like that, would that ameliorate the the image? Because I think one of the things that we saw today in our Twitter feed, <laughs> you know, you're, it's the work of the Satan and you're disgusting yeah. and all this. So is there a way that one can improve on this kind of moral repulsion towards the pornography industry and by the way many of those who are going to say that they're morally repugnant might be the ones who are consuming the porn the most privately so there's kind of a moral hypocrisy or is this something that we can never get rid of the idea of having people have sex in, in, on the screen is going to trigger people's moral revulsions oh boy um I think it would help the public image for sure if there was some kind of screening process or if there was more responsibility taken for the well-being of the performers. Unfortunately, it's, you know, it's a private company. Most of them are actually ran in Montreal. Um, yeah. That's... And well, why is that, yeah. by the way? Do we, do we know? Is it was just an accident? What, what, what led to that I'm reality? Sure there was nothing accidental. I'm sure there had to be something that had to do with like internet regulation oh, right. or okay. taxing, whatever it is. I know, um, I'm pretty sure their financials are over in Europe, but it's it's spread out. I'm sure it's very strategic. Um, I mean, the guys at the top aren't dummies, and you know they're not doing this to make friends, and they don't know poor Susie from Indiana that just got you know thrown into the industry because she couldn't pay her bills. Like they're they're separated from that, and I mean to a point, you kind of have to be right if every surgeon was just emotionally tied to the outcome of his patient. Like he's not going to be a good surgeon, so. It's not a perfect world. Again, I do think a lot of the issues we have are because of certain stigmas. So I was, um, what was I? So I'm, I'm doing a nonprofit right now. I just got put on like, this board for this up and coming nonprofit. And it's, um, what they do is they free women and children from sex slavery. Wow. So it's having a, a meeting with one of the other like directors and he didn't really know my story or like anything about me. Like one of the founders alluded to it and he just wanted to ask some questions. And he was like, well, was it, um, was it a situation where you were being, um, Sorry, the words are escaping me. Ex where you were being exploited and that you you got out of it. Like he kind of, that's the answer right. he really wanted. And I was like, no, like I got into it very consciously and I would do it again. It's nothing that I regret. And he was just blown off of his seat. <laughs> um, the idea that you cannot be exploited and be in the industry. And that's like a yeah. common thing that you see. That was part of the Twitter thread today too, is like, stop the exploitation of women. Yeah. And I'm like, well, there's a huge difference between being exploited and having consensual sex. Like you can't be exploited if you're consciously consenting to it, right? If I know there's a videotape involved, I know it's going to be public. I know it's going to be sold. If I'm consciously having or consciously consenting to sex with you, there's nothing that you can do to me that is um, degrading because I'll tell you to stop. And then once you continue past that, then sure, we're going into a different territory. But unless all of those things um, proceed, then it's not exploitation. Right. So I think so many of us look at women in, like me in the industry and they're like, that poor little thing, you know? And I'm like, no, like I'm a badass and I did really well for myself and I love my life. Um, so I think it's just like, it. It's educating the public that not all of it is like this dark corner that you think it is. Well, it's interesting because, I mean, the, the, the position that you just enunciated is exactly the one that some, you know, staunch feminists take if they are pro-porn, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's liberating. It, it, is, it, it is demonstrating personal agency of women. It's empowering women. It's an industry where women make a lot more than men. One of the few industries where that happens. So, so... You could be a staunch feminist and be perfectly pro-porn or perfectly anti-porn. No, it's degrading. Mm -hmm. It's blah, 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 blah. It's the patriarchy. It's the, the, the worst instantiation of the patriarchy uh, and so on. Because so, it's internalized. That's it's it's, it's internalized, exactly. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> no, when well, you can't win an argument, you know? Exactly. Well, that, by the way, this is what happens in religion, whereby you can take the, the text of any religion and you can find the specific passage 
that either supports homosexuality or completely condemns it. And so this is why I don't take any of that stuff seriously. Okay, let's come to one last personal question and then we could open it up and get out of the porn stuff if, if you'd like because I'm sure, sure there are other things that we could talk about. So you have a child. Mm-hmm. Uh, h- how old is he or she right now? Year and a half. Hey, okay, well, congratulations on your new, you. newborn. Uh, so they'll come, at, it's a boy? Yes. Okay, so one day he will be on Google and he will hit that Google thing and there is mommy. Mm-hmm. Does that worry you at all? Does it scare you? Does it cause you angst? And if yes, how are you going to handle it? And if no, why not? I would say there's a little bit of angst just because you don't know, right? You don't know how he's going to take it. So for me, it's super, super critical that I'm the first one that breaks this to him, right? I don't want it to be some like douche kid at school that's doing it to to hurt him, right? Or make a fool of him. So for me to be ahead of like the, the possible train wreck is very important for me. Um, so like slowly introducing this concept to him as he's like becoming more and more age appropriate. Um, obviously there's no way to predict is he going to be is his generation going to be so open-minded that they're like okay well it was just a thing because i mean only fans is huge right now right especially in women my age and younger almost i don't know what the percentage is but if you go on instagram everyone has an only fans account so it's gonna be really hard to find um moms that you can't dig up some kind of you know but there's sexual, there, there's yeah. dig up and there's dig up right Right, for sure. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, some of the stuff that people are putting out there is way more intense than what I've done just because it's not on like really? tube sites. Oh. Um, they think it's, you know, private because it's behind a paywall and that's not really how it works. Um, so I guess like, do you think, is he going to be open minded and is he going to like think for himself, come to his own conclusions or is he going to say society says this is bad, so it must be ma- bad and that he's going to, you know, have a bad relationship with his his parent for the rest of his life because of it. I hope that in my parenting process that I create just like a very loving and accepting and independent thinker and that he's allowed to feel what he feels. If he goes through like however, however long of like rage and embarrassment, then he's allowed to do that. And I don't have to like push my beliefs of this is right onto him. It's like letting him experience that reality in his authentic way and then just loving him right it's like i still love you you're allowed to be mad at me i know this must be embarrassing um but i guess just trusting i do a good enough job at raising that little human and funny enough i was talking to one of my friends about this because i had um someone in my family that was kind of like off the walls and saying you know like he's gonna hate you blah 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 and i was like you know that i can't believe they said that to me it's a family member like people on twitter sure but that's not like the kind thing to do. The kind thing, whether you believe it or not, is like you'll get through it. And she's like, well, uh, my husband's mom used to be a Victoria's Secret model. And he went to school and kids were like bringing in her magazine and trying to make fun of him. Like, look, it's your mom and her underwear. Obviously very different, but there's like a, there's an undertone that's similar. And he just goes, you're not going to talk about my mama that way and socks the kid in the <laughs> face. Right. And I'm like, so we're not guaranteed reaction. Sure, there are some kids that have been like, I'm so mortified that's my mom in underwear or that's my mom topless, right? And then there's other kids like, that. yeah, that's my mom and she's a fucking badass and suck. So you you, you hope that he'll be a honey badger, basically. That's what you're saying. Yes, yeah, I hope I raise a honey badger. (laughs) Well, I'll keep my fingers crossed. So then let's, one last question on this uh, train of thought. So what if he came to you, but actually more importantly, what if she came to you, if she, if you have a daughter, and said, mm-hmm. hey, mom, I really was inspired by your uh, uh, acting career, and uh, guess what? I'm heading off to the San, is it San Bernardino Valley. Is that where a lot of the stuff yeah. happens? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm hooking up with whomever. Uh, honestly, now, don't, don't give me the open-minded. Are, are you going to say, and I, I guess I'm leading the question by saying honestly, well, answer in whichever way you want. Would you be <laughs> super pleased that your son and certainly your daughter were to follow in your footsteps? Or are you going to say, oh, sorry, not over my dead body? Oh, man. So I think we all want our kids to do better than us, right? Or at least like good parents. You yeah. want like wisdom is learning from other people's mistakes or paths, right? So I hope 
whatever kids I have or have in the future that they want to do better than me. And it's not to say what I did was wrong per se, but was it easy? No. Was there a huge social fallout and consequence? Absolutely. Will it affect me and my family for the rest of my life? You bet. So would I want that for my kid? Absolutely not. And even when young girls come to me and they want to get in the industry and I was, they're like, what's your advice? And I say, don't do it. Right. Like I'm an anomaly, right? So the average income, um, I want to say is like 50,000 a year for a porn star. The average, uh, longevity is a year. So you're going to make a decision that will define societally who you are for, for $50,000 $50, for one year. Wow. That's right. a good stat. Yeah. Doesn't make sense. Doesn't make sense at all. So it's not to say you can't succeed and you can't be happy and you can't transcend that, that path. Um, but I mean, if I was like an oil rigger, would I want my kid to go out there and like do like that really dangerous job? No way. I Good. want you to do better, right? I did all of this to provide like this awesome freaking life. And I hope that that lands you a better platform to start on, right? So, I mean, I know some people aren't going to be thrilled with that answer. They're like, how dare you not support the industry or whatever, but I want my kid to do better. Wow. What a... Amazing answer. Okay, let's transition out of porn. Uh, so you started this uh, podcast. You, you've had some, uh, you know, wonderful guests. Uh, like yourself. With, well, aren't you sweet? Uh, <laughs> so what, what what led you? I mean, what? Because oftentimes what I get is, you know, I, I don't have your platform, professor. I, I don't. I'm not some fancy professor. And I always say, you know what? With today's tools, as long as you've got the right set of skills. And I mean, certainly you do. You're 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 charming. You're you're well spoken. You're obviously beautiful, and so on. Uh, you found a way. I mean, you, they, right? Joe Rogan. No, no one could have said, "Oh, oh, Joe Rogan." Sure. I mean, he, he's got all of the right training to get a hundred and ten million dollars Spotify deal. No, he he's open minded guy. He loves to have conversations. So, what led you to say, "Okay, I think this is what I want to take a shot doing." I've kind of always felt a pull to start the podcast. I love talking to people. I love learning. I love challenging anything that I believe. Um, I think that there comes a responsibility when you do have a large platform and to try to like better the world, even like 1%. And I just saw, especially on social media, things were just getting absolutely bonkers. And there was just like one conversation that just is being had, being had. And it's just it's very liberal. It's very, ex um, exclusive to a lot of people. And I was like, I just want to challenge a lot of these conversations and like in a curious way, not that I know everything. There's like so much information I know I don't know. And just to kind of step into it as a learner, um, and then see if I could provide any value to people that do follow me. And I think Rogan's like a great example because what I saw with him is when he first started the podcast, everyone was like, who does this guy think he is? He's a meathead that tells people to eat bugs for a living, right? Like that's like, they were like, he has no, nothing valuable to share. And like, boy, was everyone proven so wrong on that. <laughs> and it's like, I, I love that, that I guess analogy. Cause it's like, I don't want anyone to put me in a box. I don't want anyone, anyone to say like, because you did this, that, that that's all you're allowed to be. And it was one of his recent podcasts where he was like, um, he wasn't, fulfilled by doing fear factor but fear factor gave him fuck you money yeah. and then with that fuck you money he could spend his free time doing things that he actually cared about and for me porn is really similar so do i get a sense of fulfillment from porn not really that's why i'm you know trying to start this nonprofit and do other things in in my life but it gave me so many resources that i'm allowed to be at home with my kid all the time and spend more quality time than like the average parent. And I also have free time to invest in things that do give me fulfillment, like doing the podcast. Right. Um, and right. So to me, it was just like a really, he was like a really good, um, I guess like mentor, right. Virtually for myself. So I just thought it was important and, um, it's doing really well so far. I'm like, this is great. I'm not canceled yet. And we'll just kind of see where it goes. Yeah. You know, I, I was earlier I, in the morning, I, I go for a long walk with my wife and we have coffee and we, you know, we chat about the day and so on. And I, you know, I said that I was hosting you today and I was telling her that, you know, I'm, I'm like a kid in a candy store, uh, 
I mean, in everything that I do, in that I'm just very passionate about everything. I wake up in the morning, I rub my my hands, like, okay, what's up today? And part of what I love in in in, in, in on my show, and I think you probably will, will agree, is that it affords me the opportunity to connect with all sorts of people that otherwise my path and theirs would have never crossed prior to today's you know magic of of, of the tools that we ha- are, are that we have. So. Gad and Candace wouldn't have met. Mm-hmm. Yesterday I had, uh, do you know who Dean Kane is? Yeah. The, the actor. Uh, yeah. So Dean and I have become, uh, we have a budding bromance brewing. And so <laughs> he, he came on my show uh, last night. Uh, the, these shows are being banked. They're going to be released soon, all of them, the last few I've had. Uh, and uh, I was telling my wife, I said, you know, unlike I think other academics who truly live in a elitist you know ivory tower you know we we don't speak to the commoners the great unwashed uh that's that's not how i am i mean maybe to a fault right i mean i'll answer people on twitter that have two followers and then someone says <laughs> but wh- why are you wasting your time I'm like well i don't modulate who i th- speak to as a function of how many followers they have so i think to be successful in, in what you do on your show what, what i've been doing for a while on my show what joe rogan is you have to be an open spirit in the sense that you j- you know, some people are good conversationalists and part of being a good conversationalist is to be like a kid in a candy store. I, I, you know, Candace has a cool story to tell and I'm really excited to hear about it. And if you have that passion, I think having this type of show might be the right medium for you, right? Oh, totally. I mean, I have some guests lined up that have like a thousand followers and people are like, well, why would you talk to them? And I was have some really interesting stuff and like maybe they have a book that's not that popular but I think it's a good idea and I would like to you know help get it out there um I mean if you go solely based off of followers I mean Rogan number one podcast in the world I mean there's porn stars that have more followers than him like that that means nothing yeah Yeah. it means absolutely nothing so it's a terrible metric to gauge whether someone's interesting or not so true so what 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 are some of the I I know you said you have this non uh, uh, profit going. Of course, you've got the the show. If 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 you could trace, h- here is my dream next ten years. Take us through the journey. Oh boy! So I would say that the nonprofit is doing amazing. Do you want to tell us a bit more about it? What is it about? Oh, it's the se- it's so, the sex uh, trafficking kids. Oh boy, that's some yeah heavy yeah. Stuff. Yeah. So they were originally operating with another one called Justice Ventures and they went to Nepal and they freed um, a lot of like these women and children. And he's like, I want to do this on my own. I want to create my own nonprofit. And he's kind of bringing my husband and I into it. Um, so it's called um, Operation Rescue Children. So ORC. And what they're doing is where they're trying to fundraise a hundred thousand dollars by August for the next Nepal trip. And then they're going to go there with like tactical teams, um, like ex military and that to like kind of infiltrate certain brothels that are, uh, moving kids and, and women, um, and to kind of set them free essentially. And it's crazy because some people don't realize that that's an actual issue or that, you know, slavery still exists and it does on such a large scale. So I'm like, there's never too many players in that space. Um, obviously like there is operation, um, underground railroad and they do amazing work, but you know, there's, there needs to be more people actively involved. Um, so hopefully that becomes like a really popular and um, successful nonprofit that does some, some really good, um, some good work for people. I would say as far as professional life, I would say in the next 10 years, if I could somehow become, you know, this podcast that's regularly charting and maybe either becoming my own media group or being acquired by someone that has similar philosophies, like that would be amazing. Um, I feel like everyone has to do a book at some point if you're in this field. So maybe writing a book. So um, what, I, on your on your life, on your journey through the industry, that kind of book or what, what kind of book? <sighs> I'm not necessarily that I'm still trying to figure out like what the angle would be because I porn is interesting for sure, but it's like such a small piece of who you I guess, are. what I can contribute. Yeah. yeah. And like who I am, I would say like maybe if I were to look for an overarching theme, it's like authenticity yes. because I think that's driven a lot of my decisions is like, so, you know, with like disc scores, for example, like I have like such a high D it's pretty much like off of that chart. And I'm sure you probably would have guessed yeah. that. Yeah. Um, so it's like, just remaining true to myself regardless of what their consequence might be. Um, and I think so many of us make decisions based off of fear and then that can inhibit like our 
our potential for happiness. So it's maybe something like along those lines. I'm not really sure yet. But you know, it, it, yesterday when I was chatting with Dean, uh, and, and it, it certainly applies to you because I think in the times that we've communicated, there's, there's a realness in our interactions. I, I think, I hope you agree that, you know, I wasn't this kind of diva person, very real. I think you're the same yeah. way, you know, there's no pretense. And I'm very, very drawn and attracted to people like that. So yesterday when I was chatting with Dean, that's exactly how we felt towards each other. Dean, I mean, I, I was attracted to him because I, I didn't really know his uh, acting. I mean, I knew he had been Superman and all that, but I didn't really know his stuff. But where I had seen him is when he would make appearances on political issues, you know, typically only on Fox because the other networks don't invite him. Uh, and I thought, you know, this guy just sounds... He looks so genuine. He just looks warm. He looks real. There's no pretense. Mo you know, most Hollywood people are just so fake and artificial, mm -hmm. which, of course, by the way, is one of the reasons that people were attracted to Donald Trump. For better or worse, he was authentic. You may have not liked what he was authentic about, <laughs> but, but he was authentic. You, you knew mm -hmm. who he was. And so there is something truly beautiful about people who are authentic, and you certainly exemplify all those authentic qualities. So I will oh, be buying. I will be buying that book when you uh, when you write it. Any, thank you so much. Any other thing? I, I as I tell most of my guests because they're all fantastic. I could keep you here for another five hours, but I, I don't want to abuse too much of your time. What do you want? Any other projects that you would like to use this opportunity to promote before we wrap it up? I would just say, yeah, check out the podcast. It's uh, Chatting with Candace, and you can find it anywhere that you get podcasts. Oh, fantastic. Uh, it was such a pleasure having you on. I hope I haven't asked any questions that made you feel in any way uncomfortable. No, no, good. no, I had a great time. Thank you so much. And stay on the line so we can say goodbye offline. I'm just going to end it now. All right.